Welcome to my video on boundary conditions for electromagnetic waves. So far we've learned that the wave equation is a great tool which helps us to find distributions of the electromagnetic field which are consistent with Maxwell's equations. However, the validity of the wave equation ends when the refractive index changes. In this video we will use Maxwell's equations to predict the electromagnetic field on the other side of the index boundary. Imagine an interface between two different materials. For electromagnetic waves, this means different permittivity, permeability or conductivity. The interface is a two-dimensional plane. And to distinguish the two sides, we define a normal vector E on the interface. In the next step, we define an area A with certain special properties. Area A is perpendicular to the interface plane. This means that its normal vector N is perpendicular to the interface normal E along the intersection line of A and the interface. The length of this intersection line is delta L. The perimeter del A is parallel to the interface between the corner points 1 and 2, as well as between 3 and 4. And it is perpendicular to the interface between the corner points 2 and 3, as well as 4 and 1. Area A is a waved rectangle with length delta L and width delta W. The choice of the upward direction of the normal vector N was arbitrary. However, this choice fixed the direction of the perimeter path to be counterclockwise, due to the right-hand convention in mathematics. Now we are prepared for a mathematical trick from vector calculus. The Kelvin-Stokes theorem is the two-dimensional form of the universal Stokes theorem. It tells us that the integral of the curl of a vector field on a surface A is equal to the closed line integral of the field along the perimeter del A of the area. The normal vector of the surface and the right-hand convention define the direction of the line integral. E may be any vector field, but we suppose that it is in fact the electric field. In our case, the closed line integral of the Kelvin-Stokes theorem leads to a sum of four integral terms. The sign of each term needs to match the direction of the integration path. Now we reduce the size of area A and make it infinitely small. In other words, we calculate the integrals in the limiting case when the length and width of the waved rectangle are both reduced to zero. Let us first focus on the integrals from corner 4 to 1 and from 2 to 3 on the right hand side of the equation. When the length delta L becomes infinitely small, these two integrals will be identical. However, they keep their opposite sign and therefore they cancel out each other exactly. The situation for the integrals from corner 1 to 2 and from 3 to 4 is different. Even when the width delta w becomes infinitely small, each of the integrals is still carried out on another side of the interface and therefore the electric field in both integrals is generally different. However, we can at least be sure that both fields become essentially constant when the length delta L of the integration path is made infinitely small. Therefore we write the arguments in front of the respective integrals, which both result in the path length delta L. Finally, we cycle the factors of the scalar triple product to the left direction. 
Now it is time to work on the left side of the equation. We insert Faraday's law and replace the curl of the electric field by the temporal derivation of the magnetic induction. In the limit of an infinitely small integration area A, we can again assume the field constant, although generally different on both sides of the interface plane. Therefore, we split the integrals in two parts, one on side 1 of the interface and the other on side 2. We can write the constant arguments in front of the integrals, which both result in the size of the respective areas times the normal vector n. Now all integrals have been calculated and we are ready to evaluate the remaining equation in the limit of an infinitely small area a. At first we note that the normal vector n and delta l are common factors on both sides of the equation and we remove them. When we carry out the limit operator on the left side, the result is zero. But the operator has no effect on the right side, since no size factors are left. Our mathematical result is that at every point on the interface between two media, the cross product of the interface normal and the difference of the electric fields on both sides of the interface vanishes. The meaning of this result becomes more obvious when we split the vector of the field difference into a part parallel to the interface and a part perpendicular to the interface. The perpendicular part is always parallel to the normal vector and therefore their cross product vanishes. The final equation can only be fulfilled when the difference of the field vector components is zero. We conclude that at any point on an interface between two different media, the component of the electric field which is parallel to the interface is the same on both sides, while the perpendicular component may be different. The same result is found for the magnetic field when we replace the electric by the magnetic field in our derivation and use Ampere's law instead of Faraday's law. Half of our work is done, but we still need to find the remaining conditions for the electromagnetic fields on the interface. This time we define a volume V with certain special properties. The volume is cylinder-like, with its top and bottom surface areas parallel to the interface and the side surface perpendicular to the interface. The radius of the waved cylinder is delta R and the height is delta H. The sizes of the cylinder surface are named delta S on the side and delta A for the top and bottom areas. We define the normal vector of the volume surface to head outside. On the top and bottom areas it is parallel and on the side surface perpendicular to the interface normal E. For our mathematical derivation we use again Stokes' theorem. This time we need its three-dimensional form which is called divergence theorem or Gauss theorem. It tells us that the integral over the divergence of a vector field in a volume V is equal to the integral of the field over the closed surface del V of the volume. The theorem is valid for any vector field and we use it for the displacement field D. The closed integral of Gauss theorem results in a sum of three terms on the right hand side. When radius and height of the cylinder become infinitely small, we can write the field vectors in front of the integrals. For the third term, this requires that we split the surface delta S into two parts, one in medium 1 and the other in medium 2. However, 
both two-dimensional integrals reduce to integral products, in which one factor is the integral over a closed loop. Such closed line integrals are zero independent of the Lemmis operator. And thus both parts of the third term vanish. The value of the integrals in the remaining terms is equal to the circular top and bottom surfaces times the respective normal vector E. Let us now proceed with the left part of the equation. We replace the divergence of the displacement field by the charge density using Gauss law. In the limit of an infinitely small volume, this quantity is again constant, but generally different on both sides of the interface. Therefore, we can place the charge density in front of the integral when we split it into two parts. The remaining integrals deliver just the two parts of volume V. Now we have calculated all integrals and we are ready to evaluate the equation in the limit of an infinitely small volume V. We see that the factor pi times delta R square is contained in every term on both sides and we thus remove it. When we carry out the limit operator on the left side, the result is zero, but the operator has no effect on the right side of the equation since no size factors are left. Our mathematical result is that at every point on the interface between two media, the scalar product of the interface normal and the difference of the displacement fields on both sides of the interface vanishes. The meaning of this result becomes more obvious when we split the vector of the field difference into a part parallel to the interface and a part perpendicular to the interface. The parallel part is always perpendicular to the normal vector and therefore their scalar product vanishes. The final equation can only be fulfilled when the difference of the field vector components is zero. We conclude that at every point on an interface between two different media, the component of the displacement field which is perpendicular to the interface is the same on both sides, while the parallel component may be different. The same result is found for the field of magnetic induction when we replace the displacement by the induction field in our derivation. Displacement field and electric field are linked by the permittivity of the respective materials. And therefore the boundary condition on the displacement field can easily be transferred to the electric field. In the important case of linear dielectric materials, we can just replace d by epsilon times e. The same is the case for the connection between magnetic field and magnetic induction. Thus, we have finally received the rules to calculate the electric and magnetic field at any point of the interface in medium 2 from the respective field at the same point on the other side of the interface. Starting with these values, we can then again use the wave equation to calculate the field everywhere in medium 2. Let us close with the well-known example of a plane wave hitting a flat interface between two media. The electric field is perpendicular to the propagation direction and we split it into a component parallel and a component perpendicular to the surface. If we assume that the permittivity epsilon 2 is larger than epsilon 1, we can predict that the ratio of the parallel to the perpendicular component of the field is larger in medium 2 than in medium 1. Therefore, we can conclude that the angle of propagation in medium 2 is smaller. However, 
In order to calculate the values of propagation angle and amplitude of the transmitted wave, we need to be careful. The field in medium 1 is given not only by the incident wave, but there is also a reflected field which needs to be taken into account. This will be the topic of our next video.